Heavenly Father, and honor you today for your so good. And your mercy endures forever and ever and ever. We come before you now in Jesus' name. We thank you for this day. We thank you for your many blessings. We thank you again for the privilege and honor that we have to be in the house of the living God today, Father, to serve you, to grow in you, to learn more about you, Father, so that we can be the lights to this world that you've called us to be, Father. You know every person in this place. You know everything they're facing. You know the future better than we know the present and the past. You know the word from your word that they need this time, this day, this word in due season, Father, at their point of need. You know the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and you know the leading of the Holy Ghost that's necessary for us to, to listen to and perceive and follow and obey in order to accomplish your will, plan, and purpose this morning, Father. And it's what we desire, and it's what we say, and we decree, and we declare. Lord, have your way in our lives in this place this morning. Holy Spirit, say what you want to say, and do what you want to do. Move as you see fit. We're not endeavoring, and we choose not to put you in a box in any way, shape, form, or fashion. A box of our mentality, our thought process, time, whatever it may be. But to let go and allow you to move as you see fit. And we just say again, have your way in our lives, in this place. We're not looking for the ordinary or the extraordinary. We're looking for you. We're looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We're not coming to you with a mindset of how we're going to predetermine the things are going to be. But we're just saying, move as you see fit. Speak as you see fit. We don't care if it's out of the order that we're used to or may have known through the years. Just move us into the greater things of God. The greater glory, the greater anointing, greater presence, a greater boldness like those in the book of Acts. Yes. We thank you, Father. It's a time of expansion, as you have said through prophecy, as you have said by the Spirit of God. And many begin to immediately think expansion on a, on a natural order, on a natural line of things. But that's not first. And it's not most important. Expansion concerning knowledge of you. Your presence. Your glory. Everything that's available and knowing you, Father, must come first. And Father, we thank you for a reorganization, a reordering, aligning of our priorities. And we thank you, Father, we'll not get anything ahead of seeking you first. The kingdom of God and your righteousness. And then other things will be added. Other things and those other things that are not primary, that are not first. They'll be in line. But Father, we just say have your way in our lives in this place today. We thank you the end result. The result will be these lives will be changed, challenged, and order forever. Never be the same again. But most importantly, your mighty name is going to be magnified, glorified, and honored. And all that's said and done this day, we thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You can be seated at this time. Thank God for the Word of God. Thank God for the Spirit of God. Thank God He's got a plan. Amen. And we're going to follow His plan. Go to Psalms chapter 27. That's where we're going to start out today. At the instruction of the Lord. He's a good one to follow. Amen. Psalms chapter 27. We'll start in verse 1. But today, and we're just going on a journey. We've been on a journey the whole time. We're going to follow uh, God, but it's like Dr. Hagen used to say, he says, you know, I never really finish a message. He said, we just unhook and pick back up. It's all one message. It's one gospel. We just want to know what God's saying today. Amen to us this morning. We don't have a different Bible on any, any other day either. But we're, this morning's Outreach Sunday, and I said I'm going to talk some about the church, where we're at, what we're doing. It's important that you hear. It's important that you know. And, and we're, the title is simply this. I think you see from what I had Chris to put on the sign. It's in pursuit of His presence. In pursuit of His presence because it's who we are and it's what we're doing. Amen? We're in pursuit of God. He's the only answer to every problem that you've got in your life. You know, as we come in here this morning to say that things would not be out of order and things not gone as planned and maybe some inconveniences and maybe especially when you first got here, you might have been a little chilly. That would be an understatement because it's so. Amen? The heat's not what well, it's working now. But it wasn't working right. We come out here Friday. It was tore up. And we had two different technicians to come out. And the second one got it. Mr. Rodney Lane got it running good yesterday. It was good and toasty in here. So I don't know what one of y'all came out here and did last night. But, some, but last night it, it tore up. And it was 50-something first thing this morning. And so we got heaters and got everything running the best we could. But we have done all we can to make sure it was right. But whatever happened, happened last night. Because we have kept a check on it. And then at the same time, you have, you know, others. And I don't say this out of offense. I'm working up to a point. So don't think that I'm speaking in the flesh, speaking in the spirit. 
but we've had some say, well, you should have got all this stuff cleaned out up under the carport here. People can slip this kind of stuff. Well, listen, you got snow on the building, and it's freezing every night. Sometimes you need to think before you complain all the time. So what happens is it gets a little bit warm in the evening time, and then it melts off in the evening, and then it does the same thing every night. It's freezing every morning. That's what's happening. And I don't say that again to say anything towards anybody, but as, I, as, as I've dealt with all this, because if anybody gets irritated and frustrated by things not going like they should, I, I might would be number one, as my wife could tell you, because I always, always have a plan, and things are going to be in order, and I like things done a certain way, and I like it when it gets messed up. But as I was in here praying about this service that's so, so important to me, you know, just kind of the Holy Ghost brought it back to my remembrance, and in, in the Spirit, or revealed by the Spirit, I saw a lot of y'all on your videos out here playing on your sleds and stuff in the snow. Just recently. There's a whole bunch colder in the snow than it is in here this morning. Amen? Seen a whole bunch of people that like to go deer hunting and duck hunting and everything else, and I know Uncle Charles ain't going this morning. Because if it was 20, he would be all right. He can handle a whole bunch more than I can. But it's iced over, and he likes to just write and dang it's going duck hunting and it's freezing, as Miss Lardy said. He's not moved this morning either. He's got a short term. So he's ready to go. He's fine. No problem. But then you watch all the football games. And you see people out in the football games and they got everything on they can get on. And they're not indoors, they're outside. And they got toboggans on and they got everything on. And they're hollering and cheering for their team. Their sports team. That's about as much of God as the devil is. But they're cheering the sports team on. Amen? This is my kind of weather. Oh, this just makes me feel alive. Yes, it's true. It's like I told you, I'm not, I'm not speaking in the flesh this morning. We're speaking by the Spirit. I'm not speaking out of offense because anybody said anything. But I don't think we realize where our priorities are sometimes. Amen. You know, it hasn't been many days ago. I don't want to leave none of the ladies out. And it wouldn't be everybody. But I know some ladies that it'll be, if it's 20 degrees and it's Black Friday, they'll have a tent side of the road. <laughs> but you let it be 55 in the church. <coughs> Amen. You say, you don't think I should go Black Friday shopping? I personally don't care. That's, I'm not trying to tell you what you should do. Shopping wise or not, you can do what you want to do. Amen? As far as that goes, I'm talking about concerning spiritual things. When there is any, it seems as there's any inconvenience concerning God. Because another vision I read behind, not recently, but I read behind, what I have been things, about all these guys and ladies of old. You know what? Many years ago, there was no central heat in there. They had a big old tent, and some of them had sides, and some of them didn't. And they had a big old wood stove in the middle of it. Sometimes it'd be off the side, a lot of times it'd be in the middle of it. And everybody couldn't be around the wood stove, but they had a purpose. Amen. They had a desire that was greater than how they felt. Amen. They had a desire that was greater than their circumstances and greater than their situations. It was greater than their desire to pursue, and, and we would say, or pursue things, greater than their desire to cheer on their favorite sports team. Amen. It was greater. It meant more. You understand different things in place, hunting, fishing, shopping, all that. I'm not against those things. I don't believe God is either. But, but there is something. The motto of the Bible is God first. Yes. It's God primary. Amen? And there'd be many. You say, well, that, that so-and-so couldn't get you to church, get to church this morning. That's fine. I want everybody to be safe. But a lot of people that couldn't get to church on Sunday morning, the last couple mornings, they've been riding around in different places. So we can go where we want to go and do what we want to do. We can. What matters to you? What matters to me? It's what this service is going to be about. It's what this month is going to be about. And it's what it's going to be about from here on out. If you want to fit in, you don't need to be here. We're not trying to fit in. We're not trying to be like other people. We know a God and we need a God. You say, we have him. We have him, but he's kind of been pushed off in the corner. He's got to be first. We know a God and we have a God that as we spend time with Him, put Him first, depend on Him, and trust in Him, we'll have the anointing and the power of God and the glory of God, not just here, it's going to go where you go to, but in the church services we come together, that the drug addicts can be set free. Yes. Amen. Amen. People bound with all sorts of sexual addictions yes. can be set free. Amen. we got to realize, though, if the Bible's true, and it is, this offends people, but it's scriptural. I'm not teaching on it this morning. But, but judgment begins in the house of God. Yes. We need to judge ourselves before we try to get the world straightened out. Amen. Amen? People need to see Jesus in my life, in your life, and in our church. Yes, I mean. Amen. He's not first unless we put Him there. Amen. 
A lot of us say God is first, and we're very loud about that because we know that's what's right. But very often our actions contradict that. <coughs> Nobody's life, yours, mine, or anybody else's, will ever go right. That's why people that are addicted to different things, we're here to help, not to hurt people, but they're endeavoring to fill different voids, aches, pains, and hurts in their life. They're endeavoring to fill it, whether it's with alcohol, illicit sex, drugs, whatever it may be. They're endeavoring to fill it with things that will never fill it. Amen. Things that will never cure it. They're, they're endeavoring to fill it. The only thing that will cure you, it's not a thing as a person, is the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Nothing else. We have got to get back to the God of the Bible. And I fully intend on leading you there. You say, well, I'm already serving the God of the Bible. Well, we're just going to keep going together. Amen. I'm not here to say everybody's wrong. Matter of fact, this is not about my will. It's not about me. And it's not about you. It's about knowing God. We're in pursuit of Him. Amen? <laughs> He's who we're after. He's what it's about. It's not about me. But we have elevated ourselves to be God's. Amen? You say, what do you mean? We're, we've elevated ourselves to be God's. When I, who do we like in life? We like the people that do what we want them to do. Who do we not like? We don't like the people that don't do what we want us to do. That we want them to do. Who do we have no use for? The ones that we just don't have anything to do with, and they don't do what we like or do what we don't like. Either way, we don't mess with them. We think that what makes us happy and things right is if everything's like I want it. The Jesus of the Bible said, if you gain everything and lose me, what do you have? You have nothing. You gain the whole world. You can get everything set up your way, my way. We can have a church that maybe you like or other people like or, you know, all the best coffee and donuts. Better to set nobody free. Amen. Amen. We're going on a journey. We're going on a trip. And it's not just going to be on Sunday morning. And it's not just going to be on Thursday night. And it's not just going to be on occasion. And it's not going to be when we feel like it. We're going to pursue God every day. Definitely every service that we're in. Amen? Amen. When you come, you have opportunity to either bring your supply of the Spirit and help us move forward with that plan. Amen. Or either quench the Spirit and hinder what God wants to do. You are important. God is most important, but you are important and necessary. Amen. Psalms 27 verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, in this will I be confident. That's good. But I wanted to get to verse 4. Verse 4 says one thing. Have I desired of the Lord? One thing that I have desired, one thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in the pavilion, in the secret of his tabernacle. Shall he hide me? He shall set me up upon a rock. And now shall my head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yeah, I will sing praises unto the Lord. Verse 4 said, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. What is that one thing? What is that one purpose? What is it? It's to know him. As, as Paul said, my determined purpose is but to know him. And the power of his resurrection. We want to know him above all else. It must be primary in our lives. And everything else must be secondary. Amen. It is our responsibility to position ourselves. To hear God and to enter his presence. Go to Ezekiel chapter 37. This is the scripture that God gave us in founding this church. So we keep going back to it all the time. But Ezekiel chapter 37 Verse 1, we are in hot pursuit of God. We have to be careful because there's been many lies that's been told to the church, and the majority of them have been told by the preachers that there is no cost to knowing God and that everything is free. That is not scriptural. It is a lie. There is a cost. You'll have to make major adjustments in your life. And the only what God wants from you is this, everything. 
We've talked much about our identity in Christ, and we'll not stop, because in balance, that's right, who I am in Christ Jesus. But we need to understand another reality. In order to gain God's identity, you've got to lose your own. But we've endeavored to keep our own and who I am and try to be who He's called us to be at the same time, and it won't work. He said we have to deny ourselves. You look that word up, part of what it means is disown. To disown. If you disown something, you have no more interest in maintaining it anymore. Keeping up with it anymore. Pacifying it anymore. Listen to what it has to say anymore. You've got to disown yourself. Amen? Amen? In order to fulfill what God has called you to. Ezekiel 37 verse 1, The hand of the Lord was upon me, carried me out in the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the midst of the valley, which was full of dry bones, full of bones, excuse me, <clears throat> and caused me to pass by them round about. And behold, there were very many in the open valley, and lo, they were very dry. And he said unto me, Son, can, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, O Lord God, you know, thou knowest. Verse 4, again he said unto me, Prophesy upon these bones, bones, and say unto them, O ye dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God unto these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter into you. And you shall live, and I will lay sinews upon you, and will bring up flesh upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise. And behold, a shaking. And the bones came together, bone to his bone. And when I beheld, lo, the sinews and the flesh came up upon them, and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. You know God is a God of restoration. Yes. Did you know that nobody, including you, is in a place today that if you put your faith and trust in God, that He can't turn your situation around? He will. But you've got to come to a revelation that you can't fix it. You can't make it right. And maybe all of your buddies and all your friends, maybe they do care for you. And maybe they do love you, but only Jesus can save you. Only Jesus can deliver you. Only Jesus can set you right. Only Jesus can set you, see you through. Nobody else can. Amen. It's true that God will use other people. But He doesn't use other people apart from Himself. We've got to put Him first. Yes. We've got to depend upon Him. We've got to trust Him. You say, I don't know what that means. Well, it starts with a heart change. And an admitting, God, I need you. I know I need you. Yes. I need your help today. The Word says if you call upon Him, He'll answer you. And show you great and mighty things you know not. You may not know what way to go today, but God is, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? Amen. And if we call upon Him, He'll answer us. There is hope. There is a future, but not in the way it's been. Not in and of ourselves. Not in and of yourself. Our future is bright in Him, right? Yes. And when I beheld, verse 8, lo, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, <clears throat> and the skin covered them above, but there was no breath in them. Then said He unto me, Prophesy unto the wind, prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, Thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. Now verse 10 kind of wraps up what we usually focus on, but go back to verse 4, before we read verse 10. He said unto me, prophesy upon these bones, and say unto thee, unto them, O ye dry bones, hear what? Hear the word of the Lord. Our lives are going to have to be rooted, founded, grounded, established in the word of God. Man shall not live by bread alone, by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Your word of God, your Bible is going to have to be more popular to you, more important to you than your cell phone. More important to you than your Facebook page. More important to you than your vehicles. More important to you than your sports team. More important to you than anything. Because it's what we live by. Amen. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. And people say, well, I got this devotion or that devotion. It's fine in and of itself. But what is God saying to you today? And He's going to speak through His Word. He's going to speak by His Spirit, as we'll see. But He's going to speak through the Word of God. What if we check throughout the day our Bibles or went to the Word of God as many times as most people go to their iPads, iPods, iPhones, and all these sorts of things? Wonder what kind of difference it would make in our life if we knew as much about what God was doing as we desire to know about what everybody else is doing. Amen. Everybody else will set you free. And you can't even help them get free if you put them ahead of God. God must be first. Amen? Amen. So he said, hear the word of the Lord. So we must have the word of God done in verse 9. Then said he unto me, prophesy unto the wind. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the wind, thus saith the Lord God, come from the four winds, 
O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. So we have the word. We got the word in verse 9. He said, O breath, and breathe. We got the Spirit of God. Amen? And then in verse 10, with the word of God and the Spirit of God. It says, so I prophesied to, as he commanded me. I did, what did I do? I did what he said. As he said, I did what I was told to do. Amen? If we're going to walk in the blessings of God, what are we going to do? We're going to do what he tells us to do. Amen. Right? Amen. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them. And they lived and stood up upon their feet. How did they stand up? <coughs> An exceeding great army. Breath came into them. They lived. They stood up. An exceeding great army. And this is the result of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. In Psalms 127, verse 1, we say it all the time. But unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. Did you know you can work hard? You can work day and night. You can work your fingers to the bone. Even as a Christian, saved and spirit-filled. And get some things built that when the pressure comes, it's going to collapse. <coughs> Anything that's built without God and not in His direction is going to fall. Amen. It says, unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. I can labor, I can work, I can get some things done just like they did with the Tower, Tower of Babel. Many people say, well, they're trying to get to God in reality because of what they built. They were trying to make a way for God to come back down to them, but they were trying to do it their way and not God's. Amen. It won't work our way. It's a time of giving up our plans. So well, I got these plans and I know they come from God. Well, you keep those. But everything should be subject to change. If it's not what God said. Amen? Unless the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. Go to Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. What are we doing today? What are we doing every day? We are in pursuit of the presence of God. Amen? <coughs> And I know that there may be many, maybe none here, but there may be many, I know some, that as they hear what I'm talking about this morning, they'll be very highly upset. But as much as I love people, I do not care. Because many things that are being preached today are not in line with the Word of God. Amen. And the more you read the Word, the more you realize the reason we have the problems we have is because our lives, our ministries, our families, our churches, they are not done like God said. Amen. And He will not bless our plans. He'll bless us as far as He can. But He'll not bless our plans to the fullness like He'll bless His. Yeah. The Holy Ghost told me months ago, you can walk in the maximum capacity in every service, every day too. But I was praying about a church service. You can walk in the maximum capacity of my anointing. But it's up to you whether you do or not. It's available, but if you listen and you'll obey, you'll walk in the fullness of my glory in every service. Yeah. Amen? In, in verse Matthew 16, they're asking, you know, who, who Jesus is. And, and Jesus said in verse 15, Matthew 16, 15, <clears throat> Jesus said, who do you say that I am? Talking to Peter, Simon Peter. He said, who do you say that I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Now this is a revelation. This is a revelation by faith, by the spirit. Verse 17, Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou. Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. This is not of a natural order. God is a spirit, the Bible says, right? This is of a spiritual order. This is a revelation. Spiritual revelation. Flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys, representing authority. Keys always represent authority. Keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. The church that is built upon the direction, at the direction, and on the foundation of the Lord Jesus Christ, it will not fail and it will not fall. Amen. But it's got to be His will. And it's got to be His design. Amen? We must understand as Christians. We must understand as a church. As RLC. We are not supposed to fit in. The church should be so opposite. And so different. Of the world. That it's day and night. But yet they run concurrent. Most of the things that we want in the church. 
We want to bring the things out of the world into the church to make the church look cool so that people from the world will come in. They don't need what they already have. Amen. They need what you and I have, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. They need the anointing and power of the Holy Ghost that sets you free. Yes. They need this Jesus that saved you. They don't need anybody like them. They need somebody that will speak the truth no matter how much. It confronts the life that they're living, but loves them enough to be there to help them change every step of the way. Yes, amen. Amen? Amen. Our church, we're just speaking of our church this morning, but it cannot be built on my ideas, your ideas, or even what other ministries are doing. Since the 1st of December, the Lord's really dealt with me to be to just get away and pray. That's what I've been doing. I've been endeavoring to do it uh, daily. Pray daily anyways. But to get away in a greater degree and pray. And one of the things that he's had me to do. And this may help some of you guys. But one of the things he's had me to do. One of the things that I have. That is a, I would say a great study tool. I'm not sure anymore that, that God agrees. But I have an iPad. And on my iPad I've got hundreds of books. By all kinds of. Not just anybody. I don't follow behind just anybody. But the Wigglesworth and the Dr. Hagens and the Finneys and the Dates and, and all of those, you know, the ones like that. And Lester Summerall. And I don't, again, I don't follow behind many of the people that's popular today because I don't believe they know God at all. These guys knew God. But, but then I got, I can have a thought of any kind, biblical thought. And I've got all kinds of high power Bible studies on there. I mean, you can get all the information that you can preach for six months. And I would always have my iPad, if I had nothing else than my iPad and my Bible and my notebook. About everything, I would say everything that I need is in that iPad, but as I begin to go in December, and I begin to study and pray and seek God's face, my goal was to get some plans. Because I said, I don't, one of the things that irks me more than anything, and I have a hard time with it, because I'm the opposite, is the way most people live, is they don't know what they're going to do when they wake up in the morning. I don't understand that. I don't understand that. I don't, I mean, I just don't, I don't function, I can't function that way. I can't function that way. People say, well, I believe in just being spontaneous. That might be all right once in a while, but a spontaneous person is never a successful person. I've never seen one yet because you've got to have a plan. And you've got to stay committed to it. You've got to stay faithful. I remember them asking a leader one time, I'm not going to say who it is, but he's very world-renowned today. And they, and they asked the leader, they said, what do you, what do you, I, I, we want to know your secret. What do you do to be successful? And he said, I'm not sure you do. He said, because when you see my secret, you're going to think it's very boring. He said, because I do the same thing every single day. He said, I got a certain time to wake up. I got a certain time that I do everything. Other people's plan, he's working his plan. He said, I got a plan. This is what I follow. So I'm always a plan person. But as I went in December, it's January now, when the beginning of December, uh, I wanted to get ahead of the, so what we try to do here, that the church trying to get better every year, not worse. Well, I want a plan. I want every date scheduled out. I want everything scheduled out. Everything we're going to do for the whole year, I want it, I want it done by January the 1st. I want it done. That's the goal. We want it done ahead of time. We can let everybody know and there's certain things you have to, to do that with. Well, that's my plan when I go to pray. But immediately when I went in the beginning, I don't know if it was December 1st. It might have been then November the 1st, whatever it was. But regardless, right there at the beginning, I went to pray and started seeking God. And immediately, He turned it back on me. I'm praying for the church and He said, no, I want to talk to you first. And I want to talk to you about you. You know who God wants to talk to you about most? Amen. You. Amen. Now, I wasn't coming and praying against anybody or even about problems in the church. It was just planning. And the Lord spoke to me, and He said, that's part of your problem. He said, you always got to have a plan, and I'm not going to give you one until you get some things adjusted, until you get some things right. And He said, this is another thing. This may help some of you guys, because this is in balance now. I'm not telling you not to listen to anybody else. You listen to me this morning. God's placed people in your life for you to listen to, but listen to me. Even what you hear this morning from me, you need to get what God is saying. You need to be always seeking the voice of God. I did my devotion the wee hours of the morning, early in the morning, just like a lot of you guys do. I, I don't do it anymore. I quit because the Holy Ghost don't do it. I'm not telling you you got to do the same thing, but this is what he said to me. He said, from now on when you study and pray, and you say, well, you may come back to those things. I may come back to things I put down, but it's going to be God that leads me back. He said, I want you to put your iPad down. That's what I couldn't do without. I have my Bible. You say, you've got to have your Bible. Well, I've got 25 Bibles on my iPad. Every kind of thing you need, every Greek, Hebrew word, every study tool you need, i got all of it. And I've always taken this Bible regardless. This is my King James and Dick's Bible. But, but I always got this one. I take my Bible and my iPad and my notebook. And he said, put it down and I'll pick it back up. Not my Bible, my iPad. He said, this is part of what's wrong. 
He said, I've got some things that I want to say to you. And I want it to come from me. And he said, through your devotion in the morning. And he said, through every high-powered Bible study and every commentary. He said, what you're getting every day is what everybody else is saying that I'm saying. He said, I want to talk to you directly. He said, take your Bible and take your notebook. And he did tell me I could take my Strong's Concordance. Yeah. It's awesome. You, can, you need to know. You need to know what some of these words mean. Uh, and I take my Strong's Concordance with me. But that's what I carry with me every day to study. I don't bring it out here because i got one in my office already. But that's what I carry when I go anywhere else to study and get away and pray. And the Lord said, this is the situation. And I've said this before. But this is the situation that the church is in without knowing it and realizing it. We're hearing a lot of things. A lot of people don't understand. That doesn't mean that devotions are, are not of God. But what if your devotion is not what God wants to say to you today? What if it's not? What if it has nothing to do? And you say, well, God can align these things. You need to sit down with your Bible. You need to sit down with a notebook. Because you need to take notes. Because don't tell me the Lord will speak to you. Because He will. And you need to sit down. And you need to take your notebook. And you need to praise God. And you need to say, God, what do you want to say to me? What do you have to say to me? And he'll begin to, to deal with you. He'll begin to, to talk to you. But he told me, he said, you're hearing what everybody else is saying. And he told me this, and this has to be in balance. I've talked to Laura Lee about this some. But he said, even, you know, and most people know how I feel about Dr. Hagen already. I'm not contradicting anything that I've ever said before. Because his ministry, the balance of his message, has helped me more than anybody's has. And I have no hesitancy in saying that. It has but at the same time, he said, every single one of these other men that, that you follow, he said, I had an anointing upon them and a message that they were to bring to the body of Christ. And they brought it. And it's helped you. And I'm not quitting listening to other people. I don't mean it that way. But at the same time, he said, I've got a message that I want you to bring. And as long as your soul focuses on what everybody else is bringing, you're not going to hear what I'm telling you to bring. He said, I want you to start spending more time simply listening to me. And I believe that that's a prevalent among many of us today. You can have all the books in the world about God you want. You need to talk to God. This is the Bible. This is God speaking to you. Amen? And many people are so confused because you got everybody, just the Bible is of itself says it's of no private interpretation. But we listen to ten different people. You know, I, I got a leadership magazine one time. And plan on saying none of this, but I got a, a leadership magazine one time, you know, and I got into leadership real big, and, and I'm not anymore because I now know that I'm going to follow the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And, and many, again, will disagree with a lot of the things that I say and do. But you've got to remember who you're going to answer to and get others up. Who you're going to please. Amen. I got this leadership magazine, started reading. The first article was real good. But in the same magazine, by the time I got done, I was more confused than I've ever, ever been before in my life. Because in this leadership matter, they probably still got it. The title of it was leadership and the leadership monthly. And, and I'm not against these individuals by any means. Uh, I'm not going to say they didn't know what they were talking about and it didn't work for them. But by the time I got to them, it's so frustrated and confused and discouraged. I threw it down and never picked it back up again. And never read another one until this day. Because every one of them was high-powered, great leaders. And every one of them contradicted the other one. The other one said, the first one said, this is what you got to do. And that sounded good. And the next article, he said, whatever you do, don't do this. I think the editor, the one who put it together, he didn't read all of himself. Because it looked and sounded pretty ignorant. You get to listen to everybody else, you'll be confused. There's people in your life that God's placed for you to listen to, but if we're not careful, we're listening to everybody but God. He talked to me about the social realm. And he said, the church is now set up. You've heard me say this repeatedly, and I'm going to keep saying it because we're going to write it. We're going to correct it. We're going to make it right. He said, the church is set up now where everybody knows everybody. Through fellowships, through social media, through everything. He said, everybody knows everybody and talks to everybody and knows what everybody's doing. He said, but me. We can have the greatest, if we think we do, the greatest relationships among each other. Maybe feel good when we leave, but we haven't been in touch with the one that will change it all over the course of our lives forever. We've gained nothing. It's of no benefit. Amen? But people have gone to the Word, even the book of Acts, and took out that they had fellowship. It's not all they had. It's not all they had. Amen? They prayed. They sought God. You know, if we go to the book of Acts, we can go there. In the beginning, there's all in one accord, one place. We know when the Holy Ghost filled. And we say, I want this more than anything in, in the world. Just like the Holy Ghost filled that day. I want this in the church today. You need to understand something about the 120 that went that day. They didn't take an afternoon pack or lunch. 
And let me tell you something about this 120 that went and waited and tarried like God told them to in the Holy Ghost. They all had families. They all had jobs or vocations. They all had responsibilities. But they listened to Jesus about everything else. Amen. You can think whatever you want to think. They had just like you and I have when you make a commitment to God. They had people behind telling them, don't you know you got this? Don't you know you got that? Don't you know you got the other? But they went and they stayed. You say, how long they stayed? They stayed till the Holy Ghost fell. That's how long they stayed. Amen? Now, we don't need him to fall again in that sense. God's never removed him. But when we get to 12 o'clock, and no, I'm not trying to keep you after today. When we get to 12 o'clock, and the further it gets behind 12 o'clock, the more irritated we get, we're flesh ruled and dominated. Yes. Amen? Because what matters is not what matters. It doesn't matter. This morning, it's not about that. We want to make, we're not ignorant. We want to make things, we don't want to say as comfortable as possible. We're not trying to do without heat to prove a point. But I've done the same thing I'm doing right now if it was zero when I got here and nothing started working, I would not have changed what I'm doing. Because it's not based on my circumstances and my feeling. Another thing, it'd be good for this old body to be put under more often than it is. Amen? Amen? Because it's not to be worshipped. We are a spirit, have a soul, and live in a body. The spirit's to be the king. The soul is to be the servant. And the body's to be the slave. It's told exactly what to do. And what it needs to be told to do almost all the time is sit down and shut up. Amen? That's what it means. I'm talking my mind. I'm not, I'm not critiquing you, you understand. So I, I've, been, I've been dead. I'm dead. I've been crucified with Christ with Jesus in Galatians 2 verse 20. Yes, but one thing you'll find out about this body of the flesh. You've been crucified, but it is steady. Every time you pull the gas, your foot off the gas with God in the Word, it keeps rising back up. It'll perform a resurrection. This body of flesh. Right? If you allow it to. It'll act up and it'll act out. But God's been dealing with me specifically about these things, our prophecy. Not just here, but every one of them. I've watched this for years. I want you to make note of these things. It's mentally, spiritually, we'd say in the spirit more than anything. But every year, there's a different prophecy. This year, the Holy Ghost, I mean, i got it wrote down in my notebook where I'm studying and praying out right now. It's, it's not here. But, but he, the Holy Ghost told me, and then it came out in front of the church. And it came out in a greater degree in front of the church. But that this year was to be a year of expansion. The specific words to me were this is to be a year of expansion in every good area. Because if you've got problems, you don't want expansion of those. So he said, God always knows what he's talking about. He said this is to, to be a year of expansion in every good area of your life. And then he gave me a list of many things that are going to happen. But did you know prophecy is conditional? I said it's conditional. What's the conditional part? Obedience. There's a God inside that's going to take place. You're exactly right. God always does what God says He's going to do. But my responsibility is my responsibility. If I choose to get out of the will of God this year, even though it's to be a year of expansion, it will get worse instead of better. To think things are just going to get better and we're just going to keep doing exactly what we've been doing and just come in here one Sunday and God's going to fall out, so to speak, is foolishness. We have to change. You're, not, you're called to be more than you think you are. You are. Every one of you. And I don't just say it. I believe with all my heart. I, personally, me and Laura Lee, and my family, but all of us together, we were not called here to be like any other church in this area. I don't say that as an attack. Everybody in this church knows that I don't get up here and attack other churches and other churches. We're not called to be like anybody else. God said what we are called to do, and He said that you tell them this, not just today, but before. It's, it's unbiblical to look for a new thing like they're doing in the body of Christ today. They've been doing it since the beginning of time. They don't look for a new thing because the old thing, if you want to call it that, things of the Spirit never age, by the way. Mm -hmm. Things of the Spirit is just as fresh and new right now. You know is how many times when I get in binds and face opposition, I always go back and say, what, 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 what did God tell me? And I can tell you even where I was at because it's never aged one second. I know exactly where I was at. I know exactly what God said. And I'm just going to hold fast to what He said and it's going to come to pass. Amen? Amen? But we're not made to fit in. We're not made to be like everybody else. And he said, you tell the people that it's going to change. Everything's going to change, not just one or two things. And he said, it's going to change to such a degree that people from the outside in even say they're doing something new over there. And he said, it's not that y'all are doing something new. He said this, you got back to the Word, and he said, the church, my church, my body as a whole, has got so far away from the Word of God that they think the right thing is now a new thing. That's the way it's going to be. 
But you're going to have to decide, do you want to be like everybody else? Do we want to fit in? I've never fit in, and every time I try it, it's always a problem. Most people that know me know that I don't fit in. But if you don't fit in because you try not to fit in, that's not good either. Amen? But we want to be who God's called us to be, right? So no matter what we've heard, nothing's going to change unless we do. Do you agree with the Word? Do you know that Father God wants to speak to you today? Yes, He wants to speak to us, but we must position ourselves. James 4, 8 says that He will draw out of us if we're drawn out of Him. The plans that I'm revealing today, I want you to go to Acts chapter 13, starting in verse 1. The plans that I'm revealing today at the instruction of the Lord is absolutely nothing. That's the great news that I have for you. That's the great plans we have to, today. Other than to seek God. We've been in ministry, I started ministering in 97, it should be a little over 20 years now, but I was not full-time ministry and until 2000, uh, what, 2000, into 2000 there. And, and all of the years that, that I have been in ministry, I know a lot of these guys do it all the time, that's between them and God. It has become ritual and tradition for many, they just do the same thing over and over again. And again, that's their business, I've just found God doesn't operate that way. Uh, he doesn't do the same thing every time, all the time. It's the craziest thing, even when the Spirit of God moves in a service, he, he just something will be different, even if it's like a service at home, he'll do something different. It's always fresh, and it's always, I mean, just, just the best word for it, it's just refreshing, right? But, but what we're going to do this month, and we're going to read this in Acts 13. Acts 13, starting in verse 1. We're going to fast and pray. And, and when I talk about fasting... I'll just tell you this, I've been fasting. I've been fasting for about a month, uh, more than a month. You say, I can't look at it and tell you. Well, I haven't changed my diet. I've changed my diet a little bit, but even what I've changed has just really been for, for health's sake and, and not to gain no more weight. It's got nothing to do with God. And I'd be lying if I said otherwise. But there's a lot of things you can fast that's not food. Amen. There's all kinds of different things, and I dare say this. Most people today, some of the things that would benefit you to fast and to put down a little bit, it would be your technology. It would be those things that entertain you. I have found this, and, and it has been hard for me not to get offended because it, it, it affects me with people because I feel like they lie to me. But I have people that tell me, you know, I don't have time to, to study like you do, Pastor. I don't have time to seek God. I don't have time. i got all these things going on. We all got the same amount of hours in every day. And if you tell me every single statistic about your ball players because you watch every game and keep up with every bit of the news, you do have time. If you can do all these things on social media, if we could be so enamored with everybody else's lives and their function, we do have time. That's not what's most important. And I know everybody may not listen to me. I understand that I'm not doing this as show. I'm not doing this as control, you know, to try to make you do what I'm doing. I actually do this at different times as the Lord leads me to. I don't say in every January or February, any, to me, this is the spirit of life. You do what God tells you to when He tells you to. But I believe this month, this, the month of January here at Resurrection Life Church, we're going to seek God. Yeah, I, don't, I don't care your amount of time. I don't know what you've been doing. You know, I might can tell you, it'd be good if you sit aside, you know, 30 minutes a day to seek God. You might already seek Him for an hour. So you might be backslid if you change it to 30 minutes, you understand. So I'm not going to tell you to do that. I'm not going to tell you to cut it back. Uncle Charles thought that was <coughs> He'd get me laughing over there. He's like, Dad, you got a belly laugh. The whole body is over there laughing. But, but regard, I'm not going to tell you you got to do 30 minutes or, or an hour. But, but I'll tell you this. Let's ask God. What would you have me to do? I know you work. I know you have responsibilities. Understand that. I know you have families. But you need to understand. None of that will go like God created and intended it to go right unless he's first. Yes. Unless he's first. You know, Wigglesworth Smith Wigglesworth made this statement about the anointing and being in God's presence. It's up to you whether you get in His presence or not and walking in the anointing. He said, I'd rather have be in the anointing and presence of God for 10 minutes than to have the whole world with a fence around it and it belong to me. I'd rather be in His presence for 10 minutes. Because there's nothing like His presence. It'll change in all of the course of your life forever. And again, we're going to get into all kinds of topics and subjects. i got some in my spirit. The order they're going to come up, I do not know. I don't Thursday night. I, I don't know what we're going to do Thursday. don't know what we're going to do next Sunday. I don't have any idea. Matter of fact, nobody else knows it. But I've not known very much about any service. 
Sunday morning when I get here, any service on Sunday, I've known nothing about it until I get here and, or afterwards. And if you don't know my personality, that would be no issue. But if you know me, that is not how I operate. But God's endeavored to train me to be more in tune with what He's saying. Why? Because He loves me and that's what's best for me. Amen? When you think you know the right way, and the right way, or the way you think is right is wrong, you're going to keep getting the same results. We need to consult God. What would He have you to do? And then what happens is we go our separate ways. And then you begin to seek God. And you say, God, what do you want to say to me? Because this prayer, and we're going to look at it in a second, this prayer is, is a prayer of consecration, dedication, and submission. It's Jesus in the garden in Luke 22, 42. Right before the cross, He said, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. This isn't the prayer of faith. This isn't petition where He's going and believing God for a new car, a new boat, a new house. More money. A better job. All of those things have their place. But this is the prayer of God. What is your will for my life? What do you want to say to me today? I want to be the witness that you call me to be. And then this is how this works. We get out here and we're doing these things. And then as we come back into the church, we're changed. And then you've got so many more people bringing a greater supply than you had before. And then as we all bring our supply together... I wonder what will happen. I'm ready to see. Yeah. That's what I want to see. But there must be a call to action for all of us. Because you matter, I matter, but he matters most. And we want to do it his way. Acts chapter 13 says this, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene and Manaen which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed <coughs> and laid their hands on them, they, they sent them away. Verse 4, So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from this they sailed to Cyprus. Or Cyprus, and, and when they were, verse 5, at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogue of the Jews, and they had also John, their minister. Now, if we want to hear God, there are a few things that we must do. And as I said earlier, I want you to remember, I see people do this every year, and it's, it's just really chalked up as foolishness, and we should learn after a while. You say, oh, I've heard all these prophecies, and the one that come forth here, they don't mean anything if we don't change anything. Nothing's going to change. It's deception. It's nothing but deception. On your part, not, not God's part. What God meant is what God said. Amen? Amen? I have some responsibility. I must trust God, depend upon and act on His Word. Whether this year is the greatest year in a year of expansion for you and me, everything does not take place just because God said so. That offends people. But the Lord said, My Word is settled in heaven. It's done. His word is yeah, yes, and amen. But whether His word is settled in my life or not is up to me. It's not up to God. He's given me His word, but what I do with it is up to me. Amen. What are you going to do? What am I going to do? And what are we going to do? Amen? Am I belittled in prophecy? Absolutely not. Thank God for it. Absolutely has its place. But I remember even this morning, 2004, my father preached a message. Some that were there would remember what it was. I remember just like it was today. He got up in January and said the Holy Ghost told him 2004 was a year for more. I say, was he wrong? Did he lie? No. I never said that. I don't doubt the Holy Ghost said that. But as far as our family as a whole, that was one of the worst years there's ever been. If it was more anything, it was more heartache. That's the year daddy died. And he's the one preaching message. So God didn't lie. And I'm not saying that daddy lied. But I'll just say 2004 was a year for more and it went on and it wasn't talking about the year for more heartache and anguish and all these kind of things. Amen? It's talking about 2004 is a year of more good things. The blessings of God and all sorts of things. And then I believe the next month or two found out the different things he diagnosed with and left here that December. And I'm not going to say God hadn't moved and things haven't been great since then. What I'm saying is concerning the word, we get a word in January and get so excited it's the best year ever. And then it ends up just like it did last year or worse. we got to change. Yeah. God doesn't have to change. He doesn't need to change. He doesn't change. We have to change, not God. I have to make adjustments. He doesn't. 
He's ready, willing, and able. Our church is not big enough, the next one, the next one, the next one. Nothing's big enough to hold what God wants to do. But it's got to be what He wants to do. It's why I've, lost, I've just lost my desire to do anything else other than what we're doing. I've lost all of it. I, have no, I just don't even have it anymore. It's gone. You say, oh, we're not going to build churches, church, churches, and do all Yes. But the design has to be God's. What we're do we don't need it, as I said before, people say, well, we have a money problem. You don't need more money to finance the bad decisions we're already making. We don't need any more money. And I'm not talking about the church, but I'm talking about individually. The church is blessed financially, and we're not making bad financial decisions. I don't mean that. We say, if I just had more money, that's not true. Most people, if you just had more money, it just magnifies your problems. Amen? Yeah. More money, more things, more people. If you've got a flesh church, and you get more people in the flesh, you've got more problems than you had before the king. We've got to have a spirit-led, a spirit-ruled church, not a flesh-ruled church. You are the group. You are the core. You are the people that God's brought here to say, yes, I will be what God wants me to be, and I will be as different as He wants me to be. I do not care if I don't fit in. I don't care if I don't have man's approval. The Holy Ghost told me last month, He said, I'm going to deliver you from fear of man. Because we take things into consideration, we should not take into consideration. You love everybody, but what we should consider is what God's saying. Yes. Not who's not going to like it in your family or my family or even in your church family. Yes. Jesus said, you think I've come to bring peace, but I've actually come to bring a, a sword. It'll be a brother against brother, a father and mother, all these sorts of things. It'll be divided. Are you willing to be divided if necessary to keep your allegiance and your honor to Him? Yes. 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 Because yes. we trust in the Lord with all of our heart. Lean not on understanding. He said, where's my direction? He said, in all my ways, in all your ways, acknowledge me and I'll direct your paths. Yes, yes. Our directions come after a complete acknowledgement of Him. Yes. I acknowledge that I do not know what I'm doing without you, God. Yes. I acknowledge every day. And this message I'm preaching in 50 years, it'll still need to be preached. Because yes. we can say to the, uh, the person that says, I've given my whole life to God and I don't have anything left to give, is full of themselves. Because yes. anybody that every day is surrendered to God realizes more every day what they haven't surrendered to God. And if you get in His presence, He'll show you. Amen? There's greater ahead for you and me. And it's not just for you and me. As we give to God, we're going to be the vessels that's going to change more people than you keep up with. Yes. And that's what it's about, is doing things just to His glory. Amen. And other lives being changed. That's what it's about. Amen? Don't you agree with the Word? Yes. yes. So we're in Acts chapter 13. We just read down through the whole thing. But we have some things to do. I want you to look at in verse 2, it says, they minister to the Lord. What's our mentality most of the time? Even when we come today and again in balance is found. They say, well, I want to be ministered to. I'm going somewhere where I need to be ministered to. I'm going somewhere where I get ministered to by the Spirit. I get ministered to by the Word. Well, you should. But there's a time that you're supposed to be the one ministering and giving back to the Lord. Yes. Amen? <laughs> Matter of fact, in praise and worship, it's not about what you're getting. And it's not about how you feel. You don't lift your hands because of how you feel. You don't lift your voice because of how you feel. You don't keep your heart right and not focus on what somebody said or didn't say because of how you feel. You give all and give Him the glory, honor, and praise that He deserves because He gave all of you when He gave Jesus. It's not about me. Everybody ought to have their hands lifted up praising God. Everybody ought to have their mouth praising God. If you say, I just don't like this, that, or the other. It's not about you. It's not about you. And it's not about me. It's all about Him. We forgot that in church. Amen. It's not about us. It's not. People pick churches based on what I like. You go always where they cater to what you're going to destroy your life. Yes. You don't go where you want to go. You don't need the pastor you want. You need the pastor that God's got for you. Yes. You need to be challenged. So unpopular today. Yes. You need to, if you're wrong, you need somebody in love to speak the truth that disagrees with everything you're doing. Yes. You need somebody to. You need to know they love you, yes. But we've used love as a light, love and grace as a license for sin. Permissiveness. Amen? It was, oh, we don't just mean about certain things. No, we just to put what God says above feelings and above what people say is my priority. Right? Because He's first. So what did they do? They ministered to the Lord. And then what else does it say? They ministered to the Lord and fasted. And fasted. You see that? They ministered to the Lord and they fasted. I can't teach on fasting this morning. 
That's one of the messages in my heart, and we may be getting to it here shortly. But you need to understand something about fasting. People think that if they starve themselves to death and the ribs are sticking out, that that's going to make God move. Fasting doesn't change God. Any. None. Zero. Fasting helps you to keep your flesh under and position yourself to attend to and adhere to spiritual things as opposed to things of the earth and of a natural order. Fasting changes you, not God. Amen. Any God doesn't need to be changed. There's nothing wrong with Him. Right. Amen? He's our all in all in everything. And as we talk about fasting, what we're talking about doing this month is what are we going to set aside? We're going to set aside some time. I know that you've got families and jobs and children and all of these. I understand. I have responsibilities too. I understand. You can't study and pray all day long, but you can stay in an attitude of prayer all day. You can do that. You can meditate on the Word of God even as you do your job. You can do that. You can. But if we're so busy, we bypass the Word in the morning times. And, and again, I don't try to dictate and tell everybody what to do in this sense, but I will say it this way. Uh, I, I, if you follow the ministry of Jesus, it's true. Jesus prayed all the time, different times, sometimes in the morning, sometimes at midnight, sometimes in the noon time, and, and then the same way he prayed and, and then he taught the Word and such. This is my personal experience. No matter what you do, you need to start the day with the Word of God. Yeah. That's, just, that's just me. Yeah. It, you, it's what you need to start with. It's more important than anything else. Yeah. And if you want to get your day started right, it's not your coffee that's the most important. Your cappuccino. It's not your uh, Facebook time. And it's not your whatever time. Whatever it is that you do, that's not what's most important. You said, my children get up at such and such a time. Well, it's time to fast. You might get up 30 minutes before that. So I can't do that. Well, just be careful that what you're saying is, is not this, that, that I'm not willing to sacrifice anything on my part to know God. We've just been blaming God for too long. God, why not this? Why not that? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you doing that? God's not withholding His blessings from us, church. He's not. We talk about this move of God. He's not one iota are we waiting on God in the sense that He doesn't already will to move. He already wills to move this day. This day He wants to move. Amen? Amen. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost is upon us now. Amen. It's not about what we have. We know what we have. What are we going to do with what God has done? What are we going to do with what God has given us? Do you want to know Him? Yes. And if you answer that question, yes, which is the right answer, are you willing to count the cost? Count the cost to pay the price to lose yourself daily, every day. I'll tell you this, thank you, Mr. Lord, Pastor Jeremy Hoover said when they was up earlier, but they made the statement that Dr. Hagen said, it never costs to serve God. It always pays. You'll not give up, and that's another message, but you'll not give up anything in your daily routine in life with God that you'll not gain so much more. You don't lose anything with giving up with God. You lose nothing and gain everything. But they fasted. They ministered to the Lord. They fasted. And then what happened? The Holy Ghost said, they said, you said, I want, I, want, I want to hear from God. They did too. So they positioned themselves to do so. Right? They ministered to the Lord. They fasted. And the Holy Ghost said. And then if we read down a little bit further. We, we read it a while ago. But it says in verse 4. And this is the way we need to go forth. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. <coughs> People say, I, I, I'm so busy. Doing what? Doing what? What are we so busy doing? So I'm going everywhere. Yeah, but if everywhere we go is just a bunch of busyness and going, and it's not what God told us to do, it's going to come and all. No purpose. What has the Holy Ghost said? He has direction for you, for me, for our family, and for the church. God has a plan for our lives. <coughs> But it's not hidden over here in, this, in the woods. You're not going to find the specific plan of God for your life. You're not going to find it in your devotion. You're not going to find it. He wants to, he's got a plan that is specifically for you. He's got, a, he's got a plan for the person that wrote your devotional. But it's for them. They may can say some things that will encourage you. But all I can do is tell you what he told me. This one thing we're going to do. It's in Psalms 27, 4, but also in the Philippians chapter 3, we know we're not going there. But in verse 10, we know that that whole chapter, if you want something to study, Philippians chapter 3, you study. Chapter 2 as well. 
the book's very short, the whole book of Philippians. If you want something to study, you can study the book of Philippians. But you can see Paul in, in Philippians chapter 3. And Paul was willing to lose what? To gain Christ. Absolutely every time. And people say, well, there's no way that I can change. Paul was a chief sinner. He said so himself. Murdered Christians and was a witness to the stoning and killing of Stephen. The man of God standing there. You're not out of reach of God. You're not out of reach of Jesus. You're not out of reach of the power of the Holy Spirit. You're not. And it's not on God. Will you give your heart and life to Him? Will we do so? I want to close with this in Mark chapter 9 this morning. I've got much more notes, but it doesn't matter. And this isn't about even time for me this morning. We're going to come back. We're going to come back Thursday and look at some things. Mark chapter 9. It's supposed to be about, what, 60 or 70 by the end of the week or first of the next week. So you don't have to worry about any snow. You don't wear your shorts. Dang, you went out of change. You need to keep it on. <laughs> Mark chapter 9. <coughs> verse, well, we're not going to read the whole thing. We read it all the time. We read it a few weeks ago talking about spirit of suicide and how to deal with those thoughts. This this little boy had a demon spirit. Father brought the, the little boy. You know, it's just it's little boys being ravished. And you know how your parents are. We are as well. It just, just will rip your heart out to see your children, you know, suffer those, I haven't seen to that degree, but see your children suffer, you know, in pain and, and, and just sickness and such. But this little boy is just being ravished, you know, to the point of death, uh, even suicidal, because of this demon spirit. And this father has brought this child. He brought this child to the disciples, and, and, and they couldn't cast the, the demon out. And, and many would say, well, you know, then they took it to Jesus. Him to Jesus, and Jesus set him free. It's true, but but Jesus called them, you know, faithless, faithless generation. And he said, and, and the reason you say, why would he say that? Because you know we know Jesus could cast him out, but the disciples couldn't. No, that's not true. Jesus had already given the disciples, just like the church today. I always left out from all of my life and going to this scripture. I left out verses 28 and 29, which is what we're fixing to close with. I left these out for years, just simply because I didn't have a, much explanation. You know, for what it meant. But the disciples couldn't cast this demon out, although Jesus already gave them the power to do so. So there was a problem not on Jesus' part, or God's, but it's on the part of the disciples, right? And Jesus said, we're we'll picking up verse 21. He asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? He said, of a child. And oftentimes it's cast him into the fire, into the waters to destroy him. But if thou can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said, unto him if you can believe all things are possible to him that believe straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears Lord I believe help thou my unbelief when Jesus saw that the people came running together he rebuked the foul spirit saying unto him thou dumb and deaf spirit I charge thee come out of him and enter no more into him and the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him and he was as one dead insomuch that many said he is dead Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast him out? This was his answer. He called him a faithful generation up in verse 19, as he mentioned a while ago. But they said, they asked him Jesus in private, why could we not cast him out? Verse 29 says this, and he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me one day and we just said, Fasting doesn't change God, it changes you. It prepares you for what's ahead. Right? Helps you keep the flesh under and be in tune with the Spirit of God. We've said God's not withholding anything. And it's true. But the Holy Ghost spoke to me and He took me to this passage to explain to me what it means. He said they had the power, they had the authority to set this boy free. Cast this demon out. He said, it's the Lord he said, it's just like my church today. And he said, and, and people say, you know, they use this to prove there's different levels of satanic power. I would agree with that. It's true. But at the same time, this is what the Holy Ghost told me. He said, this kind, the Bible says, can come forth but by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. And we're not going there, but if we went further back, went to Matthew chapter 26, you remember Jesus talking about, in the book of Mark, it'll be further forward, uh, turning your Bible, we'll be looking back. But we know that, that he told them to watch and pray. And even though he told them to watch and pray, what were they doing? Instead of praying, they're sleeping. What have we been doing instead of praying? But I, I haven't been sleeping. So I haven't been sleeping. You know, I've been working. See, the, the problem with this is, is, is this. We're going to get into it later on. But in balance, a lot of things in your life are not necessarily evil. 
It's where the problem comes in for most Christians. They know what they shouldn't be doing, committing adultery and drugs and all these sorts of things. There's no doubt concerning those things. You know, whether it's sin or not, you know that. And thank God for the word and Jesus can set you free. But the problem for most Christians is the busyness of life. Everybody would say, well, i got stuff i got to do. That's true. But you also have to determine what priorities. What's first in your life. Amen. Your family is important. But I can say for myself, it doesn't matter what my desire is. I will never be the husband that Laura Lee if I put her, that I've got called to be if I put her ahead of God. I'm only the husband that I'm supposed to be and the leader of my household that I'm supposed to be when I've heard from God because if I haven't heard from God, I don't have anywhere to take him anyways. You know, I'm not going to get off on this right now, but a lot of the, the husbands say she should do this and that and the other and she should do what I tell her to do. And my next question is, what you tell her to do? Where are you telling her you all going? The Bible also says where there's no vision, the people perish. Your family's died because you haven't took the time to sacrifice and find out what God's saying for your family. If you tell her what God's telling you, she might listen to you. Amen? She can't be the wife to me that she's called to be and the mother to our children if she doesn't put God first. So are, are our children important? Yes. Is our relationship important? Yes. But if none of it will go right if God's not first. Job's the same way. I was corrected about job and work. I have a completely different mentality about work now that honestly a lot of people would disagree with. I'm not lazy whatsoever, but the Bible I've been studying this week. The Bible even talks about who's going to spend all that money you work for. It ain't going to be you because you're going to die. You say, well, my children, they're going to die too. And you need to leave them more just money. The greatest thing that you can do for them is leave them a witness and a testimony of a life to put God first. It's more important if you left them a million dollars. It's the most important thing. That's why the greatest thing your children need is not fans. They need you. And they need you that's been with God. That's what's going to change in order the course of their life forever. Because you can leave them millions of dollars. And if you haven't taught them how to put God first, they're not going to know what to do with it anyways when you leave here. You wasted your time, your money, your effort. Everything. It's not going to matter. God must be first. So what are we going to do in order to get ready? What did, they, what did Jesus tell them? This kind goes out by nothing but fasting and prayer. We need to be ready. And whose responsibility is it to get us ready to receive from God? It's ours. Is God given? Yes. Always. Thank God we believe God and we've got our confession. There's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit like we've never seen before. I want the drug addicts in this church, the sex addicts. I want people to understand this because of what I preach. I know what the Bible says. I want the homosexuals and the lesbians to come here. I want them here. And I don't care how many devils and demons they got. I want them to come. I don't care if they've been everywhere else and couldn't get set free. I want us to be ready and positioned in such a place that when they come, we're ready. And yes, we love them. But yes, we're going to speak the truth that's going to set them free. And we're positioned and we're prepared. And we have the power of God so that it doesn't matter how they came in. It don't matter how many 10 or 12 step programs has failed them. They found one step that set them free. And His name is Jesus. It's what it's about. Yeah. This is only in a nutshell what we're going to be talking about. But what are we going to do in the month of January? We're going to simply fast and pray. He said, well, we need to have all these agendas. It's the, the, the Holy Ghost told me it's the problem now. We have a plan. And if our plan is not His plan, it's worthless. What do you end up tired and wore out? Accomplishing nothing. A lot of people are busy and going nowhere. No, nothing accomplished. Ever. I want to be who God's called me to be. Yes. Don't you? Yes. You can say, what am I to fast? What am I going to pray? You ask God. Yes. What would you? Saul said on the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9, when he met with Jesus, or Jesus met with him, we could say, what did he say? This is, this is how you pray. What would you have me to do? Amen. What would you have me to do? Lord, what would you, what do you want to say? And remember this, this is a little teeny thing, but as you start this, if you don't, you don't, if you don't get this little part right here, you'll miss out on everything we're talking about. Communication is not one part. You understand what I'm telling you? Because as you live a busy life, everybody does just about, communication is not one part. People that run their mouth sometimes 100 miles an hour, they say, I'm a great communicator, and they're terrible communicators. They don't listen to anybody else. They just talk all the time. That's not communication. Communication is more than one part. When you pray and ask God, God, what, what do you want to say to me 
about my life? What adjustments for me? What changes? What is it in my life that's a huge for me to know you? Don't say that and the next step you jump up and run out of the house. Stop and take time to listen to what he's saying. Very often we say, God's not speaking to me. It's nothing to do with that. We're not listening to it. We got to take the time to speak, but also to hear and to listen. If you got 30 minutes and you haven't been doing that, you take that 30 minutes, you pray and you seek God, and, but you take that last five or 10 minutes, be quiet and reverence Him and listen to Him, and He'll speak to you. Amen? Yes. Stand to your feet. Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. Thank you for this day. Many